Across the top of our globe stretches the vast but little known region we call the Arctic, a snow-covered roof on a green, growing world. This great white wilderness is the place of our story. To these northern solitudes have come many gallant men, and these are the people of our story. According to history, one of the first to come was a Greek named Pythias. 300 years BC, he sailed a flimsy, skin-covered boat deep into the Arctic seas. But the records of where he went have long since been lost in the mists of time. 1,100 years later, Eric the Red brought his Viking ship to the shores of the great subcontinent, Greenland. The Norsemen established colonies here. Centuries passed, and when the seafarers came again to the frozen north, it was on a different mission. These men, John Davis, Martin Frobisher, Henry Hudson, and many more, were all looking for a northwest passage Each of these explorers, in turn, pushed farther back the frontiers of the Arctic. And so did the men who set out to find the North Pole. From all the gallant pioneers, we learned much. But today, the far north still holds many secrets. Perhaps most important is the riddle of the Arctic storm. For the weather that's made in the Arctic affects shipping and air travel throughout much of our modern world. So the United States, Canada, and Denmark have set up weather stations through all this vast area. And to supply them, here at Thule, on the northwest coast of Greenland, an operational center has been established. In winter, the polar pack ice freezes solid to make Thule inaccessible by sea. Even in summer, keeping these ice-choked waters open for shipping is a tough and a dangerous job. But now it's late June, and below the fringe of the polar pack, a gallant lady once again heads north to Thule and to war. This is the west wind of the United States Coast Guard, a modern icebreaker. But her job is much too big for any one ship alone. So in our story, the icebreakers and their personnel will represent all such ships and men in the United States Navy and the Coast Guard as well. To the west wind, ice in any form is the enemy. This year, the first sign of ice is encountered well below the Arctic Circle. These small scattered pieces are called brash ice. Soon the ship's radar picks up something more sizable, floebergs, formed by the piling up and freezing together of pack ice. heavyweights of the north, however, are icebergs. These huge masses break off from glaciers. Some weigh millions of tons and are several miles in length. Like an array of glittering palaces they stand, the matchless architecture of the Arctic. Here's a phenomenon rarely seen, the Arctic mirage. These massive ice formations are freaks of refracted light. The real icebergs lie far beyond the horizon. When the west wind arrives at the lower fringe of the polar pack, it's time to begin a daily ice reconnaissance. This is a job for the birdmen, the helicopter pilots. There are two copters aboard, but only one is operated at a time. The other stands by for any emergency. Right now, ice conditions are fairly good. 
So these flights are more or less warm-ups for the heavier going in the days ahead. Primarily, the job of the helicopter is to look for leads, lanes of open water that lead to larger clearings called lakes. It's in these lakes that the icebreakers find room to maneuver. When a helicopter comes in for a landing, it's a critical time. Still, these experienced pilots manage to make it look easy. As the days pass, flights become more frequent. With the helicopters to point the way, the west wind makes good progress, and at last finds journey's end in North Star Bay, the harbor at Thule. The story of Thule Air Base is the story of a modern miracle. In this mammoth enterprise, $300 million have already been invested. Thule means the end of the earth, and it deserves the name. The average temperature here is 22 degrees below zero. The ground is permafrost, frozen earth, solid to a depth of 2,000 feet. Construction is possible only in summer, and yet Thule was built in less than three years. It includes a 480-acre town, and of course, the air base itself. There are two miles of airstrip and hangars for all kinds of aircraft. The jets are radar equipped and fly regular patrols throughout the Greenland area. But now in North Star Bay, the west wind is beginning a patrol of her own. She's clearing the ice-choked harbor for incoming supply ships. As she crisscrosses the bay, cutting up the ice pack, she acts as a sort of handmaiden to nature, who in turn will supply the wind and current to sweep the harbor clear. Up from New York, escorting a convoy, comes the East Wind, another Coast Guard icebreaker. Working as a team, the two icebreakers protect the thin-hulled cargo ships from any damaging contact with the ice. And it's only a matter of hours before the last supply ship finds safe harbor. It's the job of the icebreaker's personnel to fly all kinds of ice reconnaissance. And now a trip is made to nearby Wolstenholme Glacier. Since the glacier is the birthplace of icebergs, this reconnaissance is very important. Oftentimes, the skipper himself will act as observer. The icebergs are formed as the forward wall breaks off in huge chunks. Drifting south, the frozen mountains menace shipping all along the eastern seaboard. A trained observer, however, can learn a great deal from these ever-changing cracks and crevasses. He can estimate the size of the icebergs to be and even foretell their time of birth. For safety, two helicopters fly these missions. One ship alone, forced down in this frozen chaos, might never be found again. Like a crystal crazy quilt, the glacier covers the land.
Helstenholm is only one of Greenland's many glaciers. Altogether, they dump thousands of icebergs each year into the northern sea lanes. In her busy summer schedule, the icebreaker faces one job that is especially difficult and dangerous. It's called Operation Alert. And since it will feature an all-out battle with the polar ice pack, the strategy is always carefully planned. First, another ice reconnaissance flight is made, this time to the top of the world, to the North Pole. Along the way, ice conditions will be observed in the Kane Basin, its adjacent waters, and in the Arctic Ocean, birthplace of the ice pack. Then, if conditions are favorable, the icebreaker, departing from Thule, will try to penetrate the pack ice to a distance of 400 miles, carrying supplies to a weather station here at Alert on the tip of Ellesmere Island. But now, from Thule Air Base, the ice reconnaissance plane is just taking off. Flying north over the Kane Basin, brief glimpses through the clouds indicate the polar pack is breaking up, a favorable sign. Still farther north, the pack is more consolidated, but it's old ice and will offer little resistance to an icebreaker. In the next hundred miles, however, an ominous pattern of pressure ridges begins to appear. The ice here will be steel hard and as much as 50 feet thick. On the way to Alert lies the world famous Humboldt, largest of all glaciers, 50 miles across. In sudden contrast, a spot of green. And this is the weather station at Alert, the most northerly place on Earth inhabited by man. Its tiny harbor, Dumbbell Bay, is frozen solid. Still, the icebreaker must make every effort to get through, for the station is in urgent need of the heavy supplies that can be brought in only by ship. The plane makes one more pass over the station then sets its course due north for the pole. From here on, there will be no more land, only the great ice cap formed by the frozen waters of the Arctic Ocean. Sometimes the cap will split apart, and in theory at least, a ship could sail across the top of the world. is approaching the North Pole now. On a previous pass, a smoke bomb has been dropped. And there it is, the top of the world. Soon, like dark sentinels, the rocky walls of Greenland. And then, Thule airstrip. Although the ice report is unfavorable, it's now or not at all. In a matter of hours, the east wind is loaded with supplies. And with the west wind standing by, she takes departure from North Star Bay, bound for alert. At first, the signs couldn't be more favorable. The sky's blue and sunny, the water's open and clear. There's even a farewell committee of frolicking walrus to see the ship off and on its way. During the first three days, 300 miles pass under the keel. Sometimes fog closes in, but it's only for brief spells. 
At the edge of the pack ice, up from his watery cellar, comes a polar bear. And for the benefit of the visitors, he demonstrates his own version of ice breaking. These frigid waters would paralyze a man in a matter of minutes. But polar bear fur is insulation against just about anything, except a flying windmill. To get out of the draft, he decides to take cover under a nice warm ice floe. Of course, eventually, the bear needs air. And when he comes up, he gets it. Aboard ship, all hands turn out to watch as Bruin suddenly changes his tactics and decides to play follow the leader. is critical, as soon as open water shows up ahead, the polar bear is left far astern to roam his frozen islands in peace and solitude. When the icebreaker enters Lincoln Bay, just 30 miles southeast of Alert, the ice pack closes in solid to bar any further progress. But now a helicopter report indicates that along the western shore, a good lead is beginning to open up. Following a shore lead is risky. Should the lead close, the ice could drive the ship onto the beach and leave her stranded and helpless. When the east wind tries to round King Frederick Point, it almost happens here. The icebreaker comes to a dead end, and real trouble is in the making. Backing off, she must change her tactics now and somehow fight her way back into mid-channel, where she'll have sea room. the job of the stern watch to warn against any loose chunks of floating ice that might damage the propellers. In the engine room, the RPM mounts higher and higher. Now something has to give. The ship smashes hard into a pressure ridge. When she slides off again, a propeller blade has been sheared off. And through the two-inch tensile steel plates of her bow, a gaping six-foot hole has been ripped. When the chief checks the damage, he finds the ship is unable to proceed any further. And so, Call for assistance goes out. Helpless, beset in the ice, now there's nothing to do but wait and keep the pumps going around the clock to control the water. Ooh. 
Ice conditions are so bad, it takes more than a week for a rescue ship to penetrate the pack. But the icebreaker west wind finally makes it. The decision is to carry on. The relief ship will take over and make one more attempt to reach alert. And so for the next 17 hours, a transfer of supplies is made. And altogether, 180 tons are moved from one ship to the other. Under a midnight sun, the job is finally finished. The east wind sets her course for home port in Boston, while the west wind, with only 30 miles to go, pushes on toward alert. morning, Mushroom Point is sighted. It marks the entrance to Dumbbell Bay. Only 10 miles to alert. But now a stroke of bad luck. Mechanical failure forces one of the helicopters down on the ice. It's an unbreakable rule that the helicopters must always operate in pairs, and so damage to one automatically prevents the use of the other. In the next 10 hours, the icebreaker gains only a single mile toward its objective. The daylight hours are getting shorter now sign that the dreaded Arctic winter is closing in. Then, with only seven miles to go, time, the icebreaker's luck, and the last lead of open water all run out at the same time. With the dawn, the long, gallant battle is over. The Arctic has won. But the men of the west wind don't give up easily. In the steel-hard polar ice, poles are scooped out. And dynamite is lowered into the ice pack. When these hot pockets have been set up all around the ship, there's enough TNT in the vicinity to wipe out a city block. But when everyone's safe aboard, and the charges are touched off. A few dimples appear in the face of the ice pack, nothing more. The ship doesn't even move. But an icebreaker has a way of moving herself, a trick she reserves for emergencies like this. On each side of the ship are healing tanks that hold 20,000 gallons of water each. Special instruments record the flow of the water as it's pumped from one set of tanks to the other. In this way, a rocking motion is set up, which will sometimes break the ship free. It's a good trick, but this time it doesn't work. It looks like the icebreaker will be here for a long time, perhaps the entire winter. But aboard ship, instead of gloom and despair, there's music in the air. So 
the big freeze-up begins on a light-hearted note. And the crew plans to make the most of their enforced vacation. There's plenty of food aboard, and the supplies in the PX are only the appetizers. The real victuals are to be found in the ship's galley. The larder of an icebreaker is always well stocked for any emergency. The food is of the best, and it's well prepared. Well, anyway, well done. Now there's plenty of time for hobbies. And best of all, there's hardly any work, just a few odd jobs here and there. It isn't long, though, before time begins to drag and the thoughts of the men turn toward home. Soon, a sort of listless quiet settles over the ship. And beneath the quiet, an undertone of apprehension begins to grow. For the ship's radar, used now to take bearings on the neighboring coastline, has revealed that a great section of the ice pack that holds the ship in bondage has broken loose. The icebreaker has already been carried some 14 miles south of its former position, and there's a constant danger that a change of wind and current will sweep the enormous flow and the ship into the limitless reaches of the Arctic Ocean. There, a helpless derelict, with the long winter night closing in, rescue might become impossible, even by air. Aboard ship, the tension increases with each passing day. And around the clock, the deck watch keeps a constant vigil, ever alert for the slightest tremor that would indicate a break in the ice. Instead, he hears quite a different sound. It comes from the ship's Lead chapel. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Of course, the icebreaker has not been forgotten by the outside world. All vital needs of the crew are supplied by a special airlift with the Canadian government cooperating. Today's flight brings a shipment of medical supplies to restock the ship's pharmacy. And in Washington, a plan is going forward to evacuate the crew by helicopter. But all plans become needless when a miracle is in the making. Suddenly, without any warning, there's a splintering crack. one of the whims of the Arctic for which there's no explanation. By nightfall, after being a prisoner for weeks, the icebreaker is free again. But the way lies open only to the south. Until next year, the weather station at alert will be supplied by airlift. Proud, undaunted, a gallant lady makes an orderly retreat. She's lost the battle, but not her fighting heart. Next year, she'll return again to this Arctic place. And next year, her story may have a different ending. For in the long, bitter conquest of the North, the final victory has yet to be won.